Okay, I think that we are live now. Uh, well, maybe wait for one minute. One minute and then we'll start, okay? think uh, we can start now right okay so uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the webinar organized by the faculty of dentistry Masa University uh, before we start a little housekeeping message we would appreciate if the attendees could actually help to fill up this simple Google form so that we could actually uh, plan for some better uh, some future sharing sessions that better fit your needs and expectations. Uh, you can actually find the uh, link in the uh, comments, right? Yep. All right. So uh, now today we are really glad to have Dr. Sulaknan Dutta to share with us on the anthropometry in predicting some diseases. Does your measuring tape talk about you? Uh, a little bit introduction about Dr. Sulakna. Uh, Dr. Sulakna Dutta is a basic scientist in the Department of Oral Biology and Biomedical Sciences, Faculty of Dentistry, Masa University. Uh, her research interests mainly include immunology and reproductive physiology. She has actually authored and published more than 80 research articles and several book chapters with a current huge index of 22. Uh, she is also listed among the world top 2% scientists by the Stanford University in 2020. She also ranked among uh, the third among the infertility research experts in Malaysia by Expertscape uh, 2020 as well. Uh, indeed, very impressive, Dr. Sulakna. She has also pursued a research internship in reproductive medicine from the American Center for uh, Reproductive Medicine in the Cleveland Clinic, United States. And she is also now the uh, international faculty and research collaborator of Cleveland Clinic as well. She has uh, received recognition by Masa University for her publications, research publications in 2019 and was also awarded the title of Fellow of Research in 2020. Other than that, she has also obtained several research grants including the Fundamental Research Grant Scheme, uh, FRGS, from the Ministry of Education Malaysia. And so we look forward to listening from you today, Dr. Sulakna. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oitia Chun, for your kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Shulagna Datta, and uh, today I'm going to talk on the anthropometry in predicting diseases. Does your measuring tape talk about you? Okay, I believe, uh, Dr. Oitia Chun, my screen is visible to everyone. Okay. Yes, yeah. You may start okay. yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, before heading towards the actual topic, uh, just a brief overview of anthropometry. So anthropometry is the science of obtaining a systematic measurement of human body. It is not a topic that suddenly uh, popping up uh, recently. It weighs back to the 19th century when it was used by the physical anthropologist for the study of human variation and evolution in both living and extinct populations. It has got a history, uh, his, uh, it's a long history actually. It has been used in multifarious fields, including in artists, like you can see that the great Leonardo da Vinci depicted here with the famous Vitruvian man. He had obtained measurements from the human body by analyzing cadavers. So the anthropometric measurements have been long used to associate racial, cultural, and psychological attributes with the phys physical parameters. But the term was first coined uh, by Zohan uh, Sigismund, uh, and it appeared in the short manual by him in Anthropometria. 
The manual introduced a quantitative approach to uh, seek information concerning variations and alterations in the forms of organisms that can describe the association of human body with diseases. So let's uh, peep into the story behind associating mugshot and Bertilonage. So seems quite strange how mugshot and Bertilonage can relate. So uh, the story is actually of Alphonse Bertillon, uh, who uh, is uh, credited as the father of anthropometrics, the modern anthropometrics that we used based on his classification system known as the anthropometric system or judiciary anthropometry. So what happened? He began his career working for the Paris police force in the criminal records department. So interestingly, he recognized that it was very difficult to identify repeat offenders because they were being recorded in alphabetical manner. And it was difficult to identify if there are similar uh, names of the repeat offenders, the criminals. So he found out a better way to describe and define specific criminals. So devised a new classification system based on the anthropometric measurements. Okay, And he uh, uh, this uh, comes with the assumption that bone density is fixed past the age of 20 years and human dimension are specific for individual. They are intrinsically highly var variable among individuals. Okay. So he obtained measurements uh, for the basic anthropometry like height, breadth, foot size, length, width of the head, etc. And categorized uh, the individual as small, medium, or large. Also added frontal and profile photography of each profile. So nowadays, still such photography of the offenders or criminals are being used in the form of a mark shot. And the use of this anthropometric system was first subsequently termed as Bertilonage. So given this uh, history, uh, uh, the, the anthropometric measurements, the use of anthropometric measurements has come along a long way. So previously, uh, most of the anthropometry research was confined to defining a population based on the physical parameters, nutrition status, fitness parameters. Also, comparison between specific population uh, depending on the basic anthropometric parameters and indices, which were very essential at that point of time. But nowadays, the research has evolved and the angle of anthropometry research has also taken a new turn. Nowadays, the research in the current era mostly focus on evaluation of specific anthropometric parameters or indices as markers for chronic diseases. So let's see how it does. So anthropometry can serve as surrogate predictors of several diseases as being put forth by several reports. Why? Because they are simple, non-invasive, rapid, yet accurate. So it includes series of quantitative measurements of the muscle, bone, and adipose tissue to assess the composition of the body. And the core elements of anthropometry are some direct measurements that include height, weight, body circumferences, like the head circumference, neck, chest chest circumference, calf circumference, waist circumference, hip circumference, thigh circumference, as well as wrist circumferences. Also skin fold thicknesses. And there are derived anthropometric indices, for example, body mass index, different ratio, like waist height, waist to height ratio, and waist to hip ratio. Uh, so there are several anthropometric parameters and anthropometric indices that are important as they represent diagnostic criteria for our body composition, obesity, which significantly increase risk of conditions such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, insulin resistance, and so forth. So uh, 
So if we talk about the most popular anthropometric indices in today's era, I would uh, focus first on the body mass index. Body mass index is a derived anthropometric index that can be measured if you know the height and weight of a person. So weight in kg divided by height in meter square gives you the body mass index. And it is uh, uh, basically used to identify whether a person is underweight, normal, overweight, obese, or extremely overweight, Dep de give, uh, depending on the um, cutoff points given by the World Health Organization that is presented over here. Okay. So uh, the BMI, whenever it exits, uh, when it exits uh, 25, it's overweight. When it exits 30, it's obese. And when the BMI is more than 35, we consider it's extremely obese. And henceforth, uh, whenever a person is obese, starting from there, the obesogenic environment give rise to different types of chronic diseases. Okay, mainly the data pertaining to cardiovascular disease is very uh, prominent in uh, the scientific uh, publications and BMI is widely accepted anthropometric uh, index to be a potential marker for mainly cardiovascular diseases. Okay, but however, uh, the BMI, as it gives you an overall idea of body mass index, comes with certain limitations because it does not describe the fat distribution assessment. So for that, there are uh, many other parameters like the waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, as well as waist to height ratio that comes with a uh, well-defined Mm, uh, well-defined uh, fat distribution as well as prediction of metabolic disorders that include hyperlipidemia, hypertension, hyperuricemia, hyperglycemia, etc. Okay, so here I have uh, put forth some of the uh, predictors, surrogate predictors of several diseases, which uh, is the best estimator of visceral fat, per, uh, fat mass percentage. So starting from in woman, the best predictor has been the West circumference so far uh, to uh, give an estimate of the visceral fat mass percentage, followed by West to height ratio, then BMI, then West to hip ratio, and finally a body shape index. While for men, the estimator is uh, in this order, in the descending order of their potential to be uh, used as estimator of fat mass percentage, that is waist to height ratio tops in the parameters, then comes the waist circumference, BMI, waist hip ratio, and finally a body shape index. So the waist to height ratio is, uh, is now an emerging field of anthropometric research and many reports have focused on this particular index. And it says that if your waist measures more than half your height, you are too fat and have an increased risk of living a shorter life. So everybody has to focus uh, on this particular body shape when the waist measures not more than half of your height. So here are uh, some selected reports on anthropometric indices as markers of diseases uh, published in some reputed journal. Uh, the first one has compared the body mass index, the body altiposity index, waist circumference, West to hip ratio, west to height ratio as predictors of cardiovascular risk factor in adult population in Singapore. So here I want to add why you see that certain population being specified in each of the publications because anthropometric measurements widely varies uh, across the population. So it is very important for studies to focus on a specific population. Okay. For example, this one has focused on the adult population in Singapore. The next one on South Asian adults where they have found that waist to height ratio is a better anthropometric marker of diabetes and cardiometabolic risks. 
Here, another uh, study has put forth that West circumference can be used as an independent predictor of insulin resistance in a certain racial population, for example, in black and white youths. So they have uh, seen in both black and white youths. And then here comes a body fat indices as effective predictors of insulin resistance in obese and non-obese polycystic ovarian syndrome women in the southwest of China. So you see there are emerging research that are focusing on specific anthropometric parameters and finding whether they can serve as a potential marker of diseases because of their simple non-invasive uh, properties. So here is uh, uh, the mechanism behind this. So how altered physiological state can connect with your body shape? So whenever there is uh, too much adipocytes, uh, termed as overfilled adipocytes, it may cause insulin resistance, okay? Because if there are a lot of uh, um, adipocytes, then it takes more and more of insulin to deal uh, with mealtime fat flux and hold fat in adipocytes. So all dietary fat stored in the adipocytes will only be burned when there is absence of glucose. That is if body shifts from glucose metabolism to fat metabolism and that needs an adequate state of physiology. Okay, whenever there is a lot of uh, adipocytes filled that creates an obesogenic environment that shifts you that shifts your body from physiological homeostasis okay so uh, normally uh, even if there is hunger even the, if there is a carbohydrate in availability that particular person is incapable of utilizing the fat oxidation the energy from the fat oxidation for their own biological need okay so that time there is a insulin resistance and there is always a, feed, a feedback mechanism that insulin resistance lead to obesity and obesity leads to insulin resistance. Okay. And it has been found that West circumference is an excellent proxy for overfilled adipocytes and West to height ratio can predict insulin resistance. With this note in mind, our research team, in collaborations with our esteemed research collaborators in India, Professor Dr. A.K. Shamal and his scholar, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, we have found out that in population in Kolkata, which is a major metropolitan city in India, we have seen that uh, the woman with PCOS whether among the women in PCOS, insulin resistance can be predicted using West to height ratio and BMI. Now, over uh, this polycystic ovarian syndrome PCOS is mostly presented with insulin resistance. And uh, uh, we, uh, we thought that simple anthropometric in indices may serve as surrogate markers of these conditions with population best cutoff values. Okay, so our study suggested a cutoff value, specific cutoff value of West to height ratio and body mass index in prediction of PCOS and insulin resistance in PCOS women based in Kolkata, India. So the sy symptoms of PCOS is in obesity is diverse. That is, it may cause subfertility or infertility. It increases the body uh, hair growth. It uh, have uh, it comes with the trouble of losing weight with stubborn fat mass uh, because of insulin resistance. Then there are ovarian cysts, of course. Then a low sexual drive, irregular menses, a high uh, an increase in the androgen levels and fatigue, mood swings. So uh, the part of these are comprised of the um, diagnostic, uh, uh, diagnostic signs by which the PCOS can be detected. And then uh, we found a peculiar pattern of the distribution of the subjects with PCOS in the BMI range of 
above uh, the obesogenic limit and below the obesogenic uh, limit. We found that more of the PCOS women with insulin resistance fall in the category of BMI who are obese and less of the population fall in the group of BMI with uh, 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 that represents the underweight or normal weight. So uh, after doing the basic statistical analysis by comparison and finding a significant difference between this group, we thought of doing uh, something more, something more to give a, a, a proper cutoff value. So we have done the receiver operating characteristic uh, for both. So for the receiver operating characteristics have given us the specific value for BMI and it also enabled us to compare between the waist to height ratio and BMI, which one is a better predictor for PCOS in women as well as the incidence of insulin resistance in PCOS in women. And we found out that the waist to height ratio uh, exceeded the value of that given by the BMI. Okay, so the cutoff value that we found for the WHTR is 0 0.56 uh, for uh, predicting PCOS in women in Kolkata and for the BMI it is 28.47. So uh, that gave the cutoff value for uh, the PCO for BMI to predict the in uh, PCOS in uh, women in Kolkata. However, it also gave us the cutoff values for insulin resistance uh, in PCOS women as well as uh, for BMI, the same thing. And we found out by comparing the sensitivity and specificity of each of the predictors that in both the cases, the, the waist to height ratio is a better predictive marker than the BMI. And this unique study had been published in a very prestigious journal called Endocrine with impact factor 3.235 last year. So uh, uh, then uh, our study, the main findings of our study, I've already explained that the cutoff values of WHTR and BMI for PCOS were 0 0.56 and 28.47 respectively for insulin resistance in PCOS patients. And, uh, and uh, the, our study suggested that this uh, WHTR cutoff value can be used as an inexpensive and non-invasive screening tool for early prediction of PCOS and IR among PCOS afflicted women based in Kolkata, India. And, uh, and that WHTR is a better index than BMI. So this will facilitate a large scale uh, uh, evaluation of uh, a large population in a less time and will facilitate to come up with regulatory uh, policies to uh, manage this uh, kind of uh, PCOS incidents, this high prevalence of PCOS among uh, women in this particular population. So uh, mm, apart from uh, this common anthropometric markers that I talked about, there are more uh, anthropometric markers that are evolving. And one of that, uh, the, this is a lot talked about uh, anthropometric marker is uh, the 2D, 4D ratio. So uh, it is very, we were curious to find that can our finger length predict predisposition to certain diseases. So for that in Malaysia, in Massa University, we had conducted a study. So before going the, to that, let us see that what is 2D, 4D ratio. So the pattern of the this uh, two digit and the four digit is determined by one's genetics with the influence of prenatal androgen exposure. That is the androgen resp uh, exposure when the person is in the mother's womb. And this is termed as hormonal fingerprints. Uh, 
So the 2D, 4D ratio is the only prenatal sexual dimorphic trait that exists. And this measurably explains the conditions linking the testosterone, estrogen, and human development. So this is, uh, mm, this is considered, uh, it's already established through various reports that 2D, 4D ratio is actually hormonal fingerprints and can, uh, can give the picture of prenatal androgen exposure. So, so scientists surprisingly debunk the idea that finger length can reveal a lot uh, more than just being uh, the predictor of prenatal androgen exposure, but can also uh, predict the risk of several health issues. So uh, this is uh, being established that the 2D, 4D ratio is being influenced by the prenatal androgen exposure. And whenever there is testosterone excess, then what happens? The 2D, the two digit becomes less than, the length of the two digit becomes less than that of the four digit. And, uh, and peculiarly, this pattern is being followed in the males. Okay, because in males, definitely we expect, expect that testosterone will be excess. Well, whereas in female, as there is estrogen excess, then the 2D and 4D are almost equal. And even the 2D is sometimes more than that of the 4D. So this is the pattern. This is the normal pattern. But uh, there is differences among the women and among men also. There are men who find uh, the 2D-4D ratio that resembles that of women and vice versa. And that depends on the level of androgen exposure dur during the prenatal time. So the digit ratio has been linked with several uh, of pathological state. For example, uh, the digit ratio, whenever there is low digit ratio, that is the masculine ratio is related to increased risk of prostate cancer. And the high digit ratio, that is the feminine ratio, is associated with low sperm count, increased incidence of heart diseases, increased obesity in pre prevalence, increased breast cancer. And moreover, there are various psychological uh, state with which the digit ratio has been associated with. For example, it increases the risk of anorexia nervosa. It, uh, the feminine ratio increases the incidence of depression. It increases bulimia. It increases anxiety syndrome. And there are certain behavior, behavioral traits that has been linked with the digit ratio ratio. For example, the masculine ratio is linked with assertiveness in female and aggression in males, Wherever the, whereas the feminine ratio is related with verbal fluency. So all these reports are established ones. So we found that dig digit ratio also corresponds with certain oral health uh, disorders. For example, with malocclusion, with the variability in test sensation, okay, then with the rate of salivation as well as the prevalence of dental caries. So our team at MASA, we worked on uh, the relation between digit ratio with uh, gingival state and uh, our, our team comprised of myself, uh, Dr. Pallav Sengupta, he is also a physiologist and basic scientist, Dr. Padmini Hari, who is a periodontologist and head of periodontology department in faculty of dentistry, and our main students were uh, uh, Chin Vinny and uh, Amrita Sarna and we had many volunteer students uh, as well who helped us in the project. We also we had uh, um, uh, expert phlebotomist who helped us in collecting blood for hormone profile uh, who is uh, Madam Nithya is a, a registered nurse in Masa University. So uh, this uh, data analysis is underway and, uh, and will soon be communicated. So what our study uh, was shown is that the 2D, 4D ratio is a widely studied putative marker for prenatal sex uh, hormones exposure. So assuming that 
we found out that direct relation there is a direct relationship between digit ratio and dental plaque score in dentition of young adults in malaysia and that may suggest that digit ratio can be considered as a constant and stable anatomical marker to predict the susceptibility of an individual to dental plaque accumulation though we did not find a significant difference in uh, the incidence of gingivitis but our data showed a considerable uh, influence on dental plaque accumulation however it needs larger uh, uh, large scale studies to ascertain our findings so uh, this is the concept behind our thought that is prenatal androgen excess uh, it prenatal androgen exposure uh, regulates the expression of network of genes that regulates the chondrocyte proliferation leading to differential growth of digit 4 in males and females so the androgen receptor and estrogen receptor alpha activity has been found to be higher in digit 4 than in digit 2 so if there is inactivation of the estrogen receptor then uh, it will increase the growth of digit 4 which will lead to a lower 2d 4d ratio that is found in a perfect male so the low 2d 4d ratio will be depicted by higher testosterone level and there are many reports which have shown that if there is lower 2d 4d ratio it does not only show the prenatal androgen excess but it also corresponds to the hormone levels and in the adulthood so the hormone levels of the adulthood is regulated such that the testosterone is in higher level in people with lower 2d 4d ratio and there are several studies that have found that as there are testosterone receptors on the periodontal ligaments the uh, the effect of higher testosterone leads to periodontal ligament widening also it leads to leads to low test perception which re result in higher sugar consumption that may subsequently lead to higher plaque development and also higher incidence of dental plaque so apart from that our ongoing study that evaluates anthropometry as marker of diseases also resemble uh, also encompasses several other diseases like that of anemia so uh, in masa university we have also worked on anemia predictive anthropometric markers which uh, because anemia bears high global prevalence with about 1.6 billion people living with this uh, disease uh, and malaysia carries the burden of 13.8% malaysia prevalence so this are just for extensive research that should direct to its prediction and amelioration so an uh, anemia has been found to hold very close association with body type and various anthropometric parameters that were that are already published so the most studied anthro anthropometric parameters that find relation with hemoglobin levels include the bmi height weight waist circumference waist hip ratio and waist to height ratio so our report is still underway it is communicated in a journal in this rim and it will be the first study that proposes specific cut off values of anthropometric markers for early prediction of anemia among the young adults in malaysia and it will also provide anemia prevalence based on both gender and ethnicity among malaysian young adults so with the advent of anthropometric research in this arena that how anthropometric markers uh, come up to predict diseases in a easier way uh, so uh, we can come up with a faster diagnostic tool across a large population so that the management populis, uh, policies will be aided so the key take point is that the anthropometric parameters can definitely serve as surrogate predictors of several diseases 
They are simple, non-invasive, rapid yet accurate, and this will aid early speedy detection of diseases across a large population as the method are inexpensive and do not mandate the presence of medical uh, professionals. So uh, with this note, I thank you and uh, definitely you should be in a shape that complements your health and life. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Masa University, my faculty of dentistry, our dean, Professor Dr. Rosna Binti Zain, uh, our uh, deputy dean uh, research, Dr. Kranti Kacharaju. Uh, I would uh, like to extend my thanks to my esteemed colleagues and friends in Masa University. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Oidi Arjun for, uh, for his, uh, for moderating uh, so, prof uh, so nicely. And I would li like to uh, thank Markham for, uh, for their timely support. Last but not, not the least, I would like to thank our research director, Professor uh, Dr. Shri Kumar Chakravarti for his encouragement and support in everything we do. Okay, so thank you very much uh, and uh, stay safe. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Latna. Uh, I, I, I actually believe that all of us who actually listened to your sharing just now, uh, we have actually been observing our fingers, like the, the 2D body <laughs> ratio, right? <laughs> I, I believe it's the same for everyone uh, who actually listened to your sharing just now. Thank you very much. Uh, for the attendees, if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, type the questions down in the uh, chat and Dr. Sulatna would then be able to address to your questions if there's any. Uh, maybe I, I have, have uh, two questions for you, Dr. Sulatna. Uh, okay. what, what do you think are the impact of genetics and the environmental factors, I mean, including diet and nutrition in, in affecting these uh, anthropometric measurements? Uh, maybe your thoughts on, on this? Uh, okay, so these are major determinants of uh, the body shape, that is nutritional intake and in the environmental factors like environmental stress and things like that. So uh, definitely if uh, your consumption, uh, your food consumption is not restricted and there is problem in your food intake behavior, then that will lead to the, your BMI surging up and also your waist circumference going above the cutoff. So that will uh, mark a risk for chronic diseases. And uh, the, the genetic constitution, definitely, it also helps a lot because uh, our genes determine that uh, how much uh, of the uh, oh, means obesity genes are there in our body and how much genes for the proteins that combat obesity, like leptin, ghrelin, all their expressions that fight obesity also depends on our genetic constitutions. Uh, so I think both these factors have high influence on our body shape and the risk of uh, our being uh, susceptible to chronic diseases. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much, Dr. Sulakna. Uh, another question. Uh, what, what, what do you think are the potential applications and also the limitations in using uh, anthropometric measurements for disease prediction? Uh, maybe your thoughts on this. Okay, so the benefit is that it is uh, a simple, non-invasive technique and uh, has been utilized from primitive era for prediction of uh, uh, diseases and other things. And now recently the research is more focusing on their predictive values. Uh, Mm, the and the also the benefit is that at once you can predict the prevalence of a disease in a large population.
and the disadvantage is that it also only serves as a early predictor because the actual diagnosis can be done only by clinical investigation so it serves as a early predictor so that to arouse the uh, awareness among the population to come up with the management policies and uh, and then uh, for the individual to go for further clinical investigations yeah sorry i see thank you very much uh for thank the participants. You. i think we do not have any questions from the participants uh, uh just just one last question for me <laughs> i mean okay, sure. uh now i think that all of us are talking about the artificial intelligence and uh, machine learnings and so on so I, I think that if we have enough data so would it be possible that we could actually apply this artificial intelligence and the machine learning based on the collected anthropometric data for disease prediction? Uh, would that be possible? I mean, maybe your thoughts on this? Yes, DJ. Uh, yes, Dr. DJ. Definitely that is possible. And uh, the, it's already underway, actually. There are ah, apps. Yes. There, oh. there are apps actually which have digit ratios, and uh, the uh, by using artificial intelligence, there are values that are put in the apps, and you can actually measure your digit ratios and can find uh, different personality traits using that app. So that can be taken uh, further, and uh, maybe we can discuss for a, a new project regarding this. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think uh, no more questions from the attendees. So uh, just a reminder for the attendees, a little housekeeping message. Uh, we would appreciate if the attendees could really help to fill up the Google form uh, so that we will be able to plan some uh, future sharing sessions that will actually better fit your needs and expectations. Uh, I think the Google form, the link are actually available at the chat. You can actually click into it and then you can actually just give a simple, just a very quick two minutes question. Uh, I mean, so that we can actually get to know better on your expectations and your needs. Uh, any any last uh, comments that you want to share with everyone, uh, Dr. Sulakna? Uh, just that uh, everyone should stay safe and uh, uh, stay tuned to our Master University webinars. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So I think uh, if there are no more questions, I think that's all for our sharing today. Uh, again, thank you very much, Dr. Sulakna, for sharing with us. And uh, for everyone, stay safe, take care, and we hope to see you again in our future uh, webinar sessions. Right? Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.